And uh, welcome back from a meal of uh, blood, ve blood vessel-less burgers. <laughs> I mean, that's as good as any burger you've ever had. We're also on the verge of having the best advanced study weekend ever. We, we just got to depend on, we just got to depend on two more speakers. That's the problem. That's and the pressure is great, especially when I give uh, my presentations at the advanced study weekends. I always give two brand new presentations that I've never given before. I hope it doesn't show. But uh, there are all kinds of things I'm still interested in, and so I put together different sl slideshows than say are on the the uh, website or on the DVDs. And this will be someday on the website, the lecture I gave today and maybe the one on Friday. But uh, this is the first time I've given this one, and it's uh, going to be a chapter or two or three chapters in my newest book that's coming out, The Healthiest Diet on the Planet. And uh, the materials, uh, you can find them in uh, my December and November 2015 newsletter. So if you'd like to see any of the references or expand upon the materials, you can see it there. What I want to talk to you is I want to talk to you about attractiveness, you know, uh, causing interest in other people. Uh, we all want attractiveness. We do whatever we can to be attractive. We buy expensive clothes. We buy expensive sports cars, uh, put on makeup, have a deforming plastic surgery done. What, what, whatever we can possibly do to become more attractive. Well, there's a way of becoming more attractive that almost everybody overlooks. And that's what this discussion is about, is about becoming attractive by changing your food and what food will do to your personal appearance. I know you're thinking just weight loss, but it's a lot more than just weight loss. I learned about this when I was a much younger man. My father and I were very close. We could talk about anything. We had about some amazing conversations. But one day, we're walking uh, outside uh, in a shopping center area where there are lots of people. And my dad is watching me. And he'd watch me look over here. And then he'd watch me look over here. And he'd watch me look over here. And he'd look at the, at the expression on my face. And he'd say, son, I could tell you liked that woman over there. I said, yeah. And you weren't particularly attracted to that woman over there. You like that one over there? He said, do you, know, do you know why? I said, no, why, Dad? He said, because that woman looked healthy. And that one didn't. And that one did. I said, Dad, that's not what I was looking at. <laughs> but he, he is so right. I, I know that now at my age, uh, with the experiences that I've had, attractiveness is about health. We're attra attracted to healthy people for some basic, undeniable, uh, easy to see reasons. And that is, we want, to, we want to, at one sense, in the most personal sense, we want to be attracted to the most healthy people because of reproduction. We want to share our, our ovaries, our eggs, and our sperm with the healthiest people possible. And those are the people that are attractive so you can have the most fit offspring. So at that intimate level, you can understand why good health is attractive. But it also works in the, in the whole community. Uh, you associate yourself with attractive people because they're healthy. You want to be working with healthy people because you want your company to be most successful and healthy people are more productive. They can work harder and longer, more effectively. So when people look healthy, they're attracted to each other. So you want to do everything you can to be as attractive as possible. When it comes to uh, reproduction, unhealthy foods reduce uh, male fertility and also potency. Uh, the male te uh, test hormone testosterone, which is associated, everybody talks about testosterone and, and uh, how potent you are and how interested you are and how high your libido is. When uh, testosterone levels were tested uh, in vegans compared to non-vegans, in vegans, they were 13% higher testosterone. And I happened to have my testosterone level checked recently, and uh, I was outside of the normal range. <laughs> but you know what side it was on. <laughs> uh, men who consume meat and dairy products, this has been discussed uh, several times in this conference, they suffer from erectile dysfunction because of interruption of the circulation. 
to the penis. And not just the penis, but the nerves that control the blood vessels. Uh, the uh, penis gets erect because it's a spongy material. It gets filled with blood and the outlet of blood is reduced. And that's controlled by arteries and veins. And those arteries and veins are controlled by nerves. And we eat on an unhealthy diet. What happens is you disrupt not only the circulation, but the function of the nerves. That's one reason diabetics have uh, much earlier and much more severe erectile dysfunction. Uh, with women, being unhealthy, eating unhealthy foods, reduces their fertility. Uh, if you're underweight or overweight, just the weight issue reduces your fertility. But it also has to do with the kinds of foods you nourish yourself with. In one interesting study, they looked at the protein of women who were pregnant or wanted to be pregnant. And what they found is a change of their protein of their diet uh, from 5% of the protein being animal protein to 5% being vegetable plant protein is that the women had twice the ability of becoming pregnant. So it, just changing the kinds of foods you eat will double your, risk, your chance of becoming pregnant. Uh, Eating an unhealthy diet, and I think this has been discussed more than once in this program, but let me go through it again. It's so important. Uh, we're concerned about uh, toxic chemicals, uh, DDT, PCB, uh, all kinds of uh, chemicals, persistent organic pollutants. Uh, I mentioned to you during the last lecture I gave uh, here in the last advanced study weekend that uh, the Eskimo, which who lives on a, uh, pretty much all meat and uh, fish diet, has the highest levels of uh, these kinds of pollutants in any, any population on the, on the planet. Uh, their breast milk has uh, five to ten times more pesticide in it than does the breast milk of a woman of, uh, say, north, northern Canada. Uh, <clears throat> these uh, pesticides are so heavy in the Eskimo, Eskimo population that uh, Eskimo tissues, including milk, is considered a toxic waste hazard. So if you eat low on the food chain, like we're recommending a diet of plants, starches, vegetables, and fruits, you get the lowest chance of exposing yourself and consuming these toxic chemicals. And as you move up the food chain, because these uh, pollutants are fat soluble, they're attracted to fat, what happens is they accumulate 10, 20, 100, 1,000 fold. And at the end of this uh, food chain, as you move up the food chain, it's the baby suckling off mother's breast. And uh, it's estimated that a woman loses half her pesticide load with six months of breastfeeding. So you want to keep these chemicals low. They affect your fertility and also your offspring. Uh, environmental chemicals increase the risk of birth defects. They interfere with your t testosterone function. Uh, I don't know whether you can relate to this or not but I know it's important, it decreases the ejaculate volume. Uh, low sperm count, shorter sperm life, poor sperm mobility, genetic damage and infertility from these chemicals. And the way you get the least amount of these chemicals eating food, oh, low on the food chain, much, much more important than eating organic, which is of course something else that you should be doing. These chemicals, these environmental chemicals that a woman eats when she's pregnant have uh, estrogen-like effects, uh, effects on her offspring. For example, male offspring who are born to women who have high levels of uh, environmental chemicals in their bodies and eat high meat diets, high dairy diets. Uh, the, the babies, the male babies have smaller penises and testicle, testicles. Uh, they have a serious medical condition called uh, hypospadia, and that's where the uh, opening of the penis is at the base of the penis rather than at the tip. It's a very severe male deformation. Uh, they also have a, a much higher risk of uh, cryptorchism, which is where one uh, testicle, or sometimes two, does not descend as it should at birth. Uh, plants uh, decrease or decrease the risk of birth defects. Outside of this whole chemical thing that I'm talking to you about, just eating plant foods has an influence on whether or not you produce a baby with a deformity as serious as Down syndrome. And uh, 
they did this experiment, and what they were looking at as primary part of the experiment was folate, folate intake, and that's of course folic acid, which is what we're talking about, folate, foliage, or plants. So it's not just the environmental chemicals that are changing your risk of having a baby with a birth defect, it's just the nature of the food too. Attractiveness, you know, what's attractive? It depends on where you live, uh, what era of time you live in, uh, being a, uh, a bigger woman uh, used to be, in many societies, used to be the most attractive thing about a woman, is to have ample size. It happens in our society that uh, we admire most women who are, are very thin. So what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, too much and too little body fat and how it affects your attractiveness and also your fertility and your ability to produce babies. Uh, too little body fat in a mother results in inf infertility. Uh, low birth weight of the child, high, high risk uh, uh, babies. Uh, so being too thin is, is not good for the reproductive uh, issues that uh, we're all looking for. Uh, obesity is associated with infertility, poor birth outcomes. Overweight women grow larger babies than normal and often they're too large to fit to the normal birth control or birth, birth canal. It used to be when I was a child, or when I was born, a normal sized baby was maybe five, six, seven pounds. And uh, that's what the birth canal is designed for is a baby that size. Now typically babies are eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14 pounds. And you can't get them out of the birth canal. It, it, uh, failure of progression of labor, that it, they call it in medical terms. So they have to be taken out through the top. And the C-section rate in this country is about 30%. It should be just for the health of the baby and the mother, it should be about 7%. And there are places in the world like in, uh, in Brazil where some cities they have uh, C-section rates higher than 70%. So <clears throat> you don't want to be too big, you don't want to be too little. Uh, you want to be the right size for uh, effective fertility and reproduction. As far as the uh, right weight, uh, we published our studies October 2014 about what happens when you change to the kind of diet we're teaching you here. And uh, you can find that's a free, uh, free publication on the internet, easy to find. But what we find was they're eating as much as you want, just like you folks have eaten at this, at this weekend. There was no restriction on the amount of food you ate, we had. Uh, nobody uh, asked you to only take one plate of food. In fact, I would, I'm sure there are a few of you, too, maybe two or three. Uh, but uh, eating that way for our 10-day program, studying 1,615 people, some who were thin, but most who were overweight, the average weight loss in seven days was a little over three pounds. We had also better cholesterol, 22 point drop in cholesterol, 18 over 11 millimeter drop in uh, blood pressure in those with high blood pressure, and most of them stopped their blood pressure pills. I want to introduce you to uh, one of my heroes, uh, Dr. Walter Kepner. He ran a program at Duke University called the Rice Diet, and it ran there for seven decades. In fact, it was the, uh, one of the main financial supports of Duke University for over two decades. And he was uh, the doctor, medical doctor, who really gave me the confidence in practicing the kind of medicine that I, I do. Uh, he gave me the confidence in the sense that he fed a diet, which I'll t mention to you in just a minute. He fed a diet that was uh, so low in what people recommend that every physician would say that you're creating malnutrition and you're hurting the people from a nutritional point of view. But his data, his work showed me early in my career that that was not true. And he also showed me how successful dietary change could be for people. I mean, people took people with terrible diabetes, terrible heart trouble, terrible kidney trouble, and uh, gave them a new life back. Uh, he also showed you, we talk about reversal of artery disease using PET scans and angiograms. Back in uh, the 1940s, he showed reversal of coronary artery disease using EKGs and showing you could uh, change the uh, ST segment depressions to normal, which meant the blood flow to the heart returned to normal and the artery disease reversed. His diet, which I call the diet for the extreme, which I prescribe probably three times a year to patients I see, his diet was made of white rice, 
fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. And you've mentioned several terms here about protein. Where do you get your protein? I should be worried about protein. Everybody's worried about protein. Well, his diet was made of white rice, which is 5% protein. The fruits were about 5% protein. The juices were no protein. The, sugar, the simple sugar was no protein. He had to, in some cases, because the protein content of rice was so high, 5%, the uh, meat is 30%, so high that he had to add table sugar to cut the protein content almost in half. Well, he was popular not, not so much for his treatment of heart disease and diabetes and kidney disease, but he was most popular because of his treatment of uh, obesity. People would travel all, from all over the world. Buddy Hackett used to be one of his frequent patients. And they get uh, tremendous results in terms of obesity, as, as, as good as people get today with bariatric surgery, uh, very risky surgery. And do it simply by putting it on, on rice as a, main, as a main starch. So as far as being attractive, since the norm today is to be thin, you know, they say you can never be too rich or too thin. Uh, I think you should look in the direction that I teach, which I consider a reasonable moderate diet. I consider what Kepner teaches to be extreme. But when some people ask you about the diet that you eat and, you say, and they say that's an extreme diet, you say, well, no, it's not. That's kind of right where it ought to be. And it's the diet that will make you thin and also you can sustain. Uh, here is, here's a weight chart that Walter Kempner had in one of his publications, which I choose to show people a lot on what you should weigh based on your height. Now, I know you're interested in those figures and you're going to think about your weight and your height. So I'll show them to you in a little bigger a little bigger form, and look at what your weight is. This is for women. Uh, Mary's five foot five. I ask her what she, and this is fully dressed, by the way. Okay, yeah, fully dressed. Uh, so I asked Mary. She weighed herself yesterday. I saw her on the scale, and she's five foot five. Uh, she's 104 pounds, without clothes. And uh, here's what you should be, according to Dr. Kempner. Fully dressed based on your weight. And he recommended people with severe heart disease, diabetes, or kidney disease be 10 to 15% lighter. Now you think these are unreasonable measures. I'm six foot tall and uh, I should weigh 160 pounds. Uh, I haven't uh, tipped the scale over 150 pounds without clothes in probably two years. So you know, I, know, I know it's a relative thing and I know some of you worry about becoming too thin just look at Walter Kempner's charts on what he thought was a healthy weight, and then look at our staff. If you meet, uh, you're going to meet Doug Lyle in a few minutes, and, and Jeff Novick, and the rest. You know, they, they all would hit the Kempner because they eat it, the, that kind of diet. All right, let's talk about. Uh, we talked about weight, and that's important. That's what people focus on most. Let's talk about the skin for a little bit and how what you eat changes uh, your just general glow, your general attractive appearance. Uh, this is a blood vessel system you see up here on top. We've got a, a, red, a small red arterial, or you can call it an artery, and then it goes down into capillaries and then down to the vein. Well, as it uh, transitions through the tissues, these uh, capillaries, they give off oxygen. And oxygenated blood is red. And when the oxygen leaves, the blood turns blue. Now, when you look at people's complexions, uh, sometimes what comes to mind is they look to have pallor, lack of circulation. Uh, uh, they may be grayish or bluish in color. Well, that's because of the change and flow of uh, uh, blood through their tissues. You've heard the expression, uh, she looks in the pink, or I feel in the pink, in the pink is a description that's of a very attractive state, which is based upon how good a blood flow, how efficient the blood flow is to your, uh, your veins and capillaries in, in your skin. Now, the way you change the, uh, the flow in your, in your blood vessels is by what you eat. And I'll show you this in a still motion here. This is adding fat to the diet, uh, animal fat, saturated fat, or vegetable fat. In fact, 
vegetable fat makes the changes I'm going to show you more severe and last longer. So in the uh, second frame up there, what you see is uh, prior to a fatty meal, the blood cells, they hit, they bounce off each other, they repel each other, and they flow very smoothly. And then you eat the fat, and what happens is the blood cells become coated with uh, animal fat or vegetable fat, and so their natural tendency to repel each other uh, goes away, and they start to stick together, the cells do. And this continues to, when you say oh, you're at four hours, you have it, such a, a, a stickiness of the blood, uh, you know, such a clumping of the blood that happens that we get a condition where there are, are rows of blood cells uh, sticking together, which we call rouleau formation. And this sludging continues six hours, and finally about 10 hours it breaks up. So let me show you a uh, real live demonstration of, of how this happens and see if you can remember this, and uh, I'll try and describe how it happens in a moving picture. This is the blood prior to any meal. In other words, low fat. You see the blood cells individually bouncing off each other, good flow. This is a bigger vessel, so the flow is very rapid and you can't see the individual cells. And then what happens is the fat is fed and the blood cells, they stick together. They clump, sludge. Okay, it's kind of sl it goes on to the point where you see some of the, there are columns of blood that uh, they don't even move. That's the rule of formation that occurs. And this sludge comes occurs throughout the entire body. And you can measure the oxygen content of the blood in people before and after high-fat meals, and the oxygen content drops 20% after the meal. And then, say, 10 hours later, it flows again. Now, this was done by a friend of mine in animal studies, but it's also done in several human studies. We just don't have the, uh, the moving photographs that we should have. But here it is. Uh, uh, Peter Kuo uh, did one study, and the one I'm showing you here is by uh, Meyer Friedman, Mike Friedman. Actually, he was a friend of mine. He's the guy that did the uh, type A, type B personality that everybody was so interested in. He, uh, Mike Friedman lived in San Francisco. So the picture you see up in the left-hand corner is a 44-year-old fireman who's being looked at through a, a microscope. And what they're doing is they're looking at the whites of his eyes. And the frame you see on the left with the blood vessels, you see lots of blood vessels. Uh, many, many vessels, uh, very thick vessels, that's prior to the meal. And then what they did is they took this man, and by the way, this is just one of many cases reported in this paper that show the same thing. Uh, what they did is they took this man and they fed him a meal that can contain 67% of the calories as fat. Now, what that meal looked like? That was uh, two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, and two pats of butter. Have any of you eaten that way? Well, he did it once, and you look at the frame on the right, and you see the change in circulation in the conjunctive of his eye. I mean, some vessels there that were very apparent have completely disappeared. And so that happens throughout your entire body, and you can see it in your face or any skin that's exposed. People look uh, pale or bluish or grayish, and you can see it. You've seen it in folks, and uh, it indicates poor health. And when they change the diet, in fact, that's one of the things that we notice, uh, all of our staff does, but uh, Anthony Lim and myself, we get to see people up real close. And about uh, the fourth day, that's one of the comments we make to each other or to each other and the patient, is just how much different they look in terms of the brightness of the, the color in their face. They're in the pink. It doesn't take very long for this to occur. Uh, the next skin condition that I want to talk to you about is acne. <clears throat> very, very common condition in our society, about 80% of uh, teenagers get acne that's really troublesome. Uh, if you go to see a doctor, a dermatologist, uh, any doctor, and you ask them if there's any relationship between diet and acne, they'll say, absolutely not. This is just silliness. Uh, we have scientific proof that this is completely untrue. What is that scientific proof? It was uh, done by a, a Dr. Fulton and published in 1968, uh, 1969 in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And let me tell you what it, the experiment was. Uh, he took 30 adolescents who had significant acne. 
Uh, some of them were from schools and some of them were from the military. And what he did is he divided them into two groups and let them remain on their same diet, which was a high fat, high calorie diet. And then what he did, and by the way, this was sponsored by the Chocolate Manufacturers Association. But yeah, they sponsored this study uh, and also provided the chocolate. So then what they did is they made up two candy bars. One without chocolate and the same amount of fat as the other candy bar that had chocolate in it. And so they divided these uh, 30 people into two groups and they fed one group the high fat chocolate candy bar, same number of calories, to the one group and then they fed the other group the high fat candy bar, same number of calories, without chocolate. And then what they did is they counted the number of pimples on their face. And what they found is that they essentially remained the same. What they did notice is that in both groups, adding the candy bar increased the amount of oiliness in their skin, and we call that sebum. And in both groups, there was an increase because of the increase in fat had taken the candy bars. That is the only study published on the dietary treatment of acne. Can you believe that? Yeah. One study published in 1969 and millions and millions and millions of adolescents and adults also are exposed to this embarrassing condition. And there are many studies that show uh, to the contrary, just particularly studies of uh, people from other countries. Like in certain parts of Africa, the, the kids back of course then, the things have changed now. Uh, they got no acne as they grew up. And uh, you find that in many parts of the world. This is a condition of the Western diet, even the high fat Western diet, which both these groups did. They ate the same amount of fat. Just one had chocolate in the candy bar, the other didn't. Uh, I think that's a crime. Uh, acne, what happens is you have a, a, a pore with the hair coming out of it. And, you have the, the uh, sebaceous tissues, the sebaceous glands is where they, you collect the fat. And uh, you see what happens is uh, the, in the second frame over there, uh, they, they, you get more fat in that uh, particular pore in a, from the sebaceous glands. And that fat, you can see it on the skin. The other thing I notice when I take care of patients is in four days, and they notice it too, uh, the oiliness on their skin has completely gone away. You know, people uh, told me in the past, uh, that they, and I've talked to uh, the lady who has taken care of my hair for 30 years and many other people, they say that, people say that they have greasy hair and greasy skin because it's inherited. Excuse me, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. It, it, gets, uh, it gets stored under your skin, but it also ends up on your skin, as they saw in the chocolate candy bar experiment. And so you get this fat clogging the pores, and then you get an infection setting in because the bacteria that uh, work with the, uh, with the body and causing the acne cause this little, form this little pustule, and uh, it erupts into uh, this pimple, this little pustule on somebody's face. Uh, these are, some you may know who these girls are. They're the, the, the Nelson twins, uh, veg source. And uh, they've been uh, vegetarian and vegan for a long time. But last year they uh, went to Europe and uh, I guess things, other, other, for other reasons, they started eating a little more, more of that uh, vegan food. And uh, they developed a severe case of acne, both of them. And so they remembered the things that I've been talking to their mom and dad about, Jeff and Sabrina Nelson. And uh, actually, they even saw their, uh, their brother who came here to help film one of our advanced study weekends. His skin completely cleared up in the uh, eight days he was here. And so he was hooked on the diet and realizing that you have to stay away from the vegan high fat foods also. So they had that example. And anyway, they uh, quickly got the fats and oils out of the diet, even though they were eating a vegetarian diet. And they're back to modeling. Both girls are professional models. And this is what you should expect. Uh, I, I've not seen any situation where this has not occurred. And I've, I've seen this uh, you know, 
dozens of times over and over again, the same scenario. Oily skin, acne, not knowing what to do, put on uh, toxic drugs like Accutane, and uh, nobody mentions any, anything about diet except for the fact that they're absolutely sure that diet has nothing to do with acne because it's been proven by one article published by Fulton in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Boy, you destroy your life. So what you do to cure acne is just you get, you get the uh, oils out of the diet, and that means getting the animal foods, especially dairy. Dairy has a, a hormone effect on uh, the production of acne. It changes uh, different hormones that uh, encourage the growth of acne. Uh, you avoid vegetable oils. Uh, you avoid vegan packaged foods, not seeds, avocados, soy cheesecakes, and burgers, and hot dogs. And what you eat is a diet of starches, vegetables, and fruits. And if you have a family member or a good friend and somebody willing to listen who has uh, acne problems, just challenge them. Uh, they'll find in four days the oil of the skin is gone. They'll find, like in seven days, there's no new pimples, and they've already started seeing healing of the pimples. And in a month, they'll be completely different. And if they go off the diet, you know, say just go out with their friends for a little, you know, a couple slices of, uh, of pizza, uh, within about 18 hours, they'll start feeling the, uh, the pimples come back. The oil illness comes back maybe six, 10 hours. All right. So let's talk about another area of attractiveness. Remember, you want, you want to be attractive uh, because that's important in finding good people to be around, including good mates. And one of the ways we communicate in addition to sight, one of the ways we communicate is by smell. And there are billion dollar industries out there to try and make you smell better by covering up the bad smells. You know, the perfume industry, the deodorant industry, the mouthwash industry, et cetera. They're out there to make you more attractive by covering up, not getting rid of, but by covering up the smells. The body, the body naturally, just for survival, is interested in being around healthy people. Uh, I just showed you some of the ways that you can look healthier or unhealthier. But we got to deal with the smell issue. And the closer you are, the more important the smell issue becomes. Uh, if you are unhealthy, you smell unhealthy. And if you're healthy, yeah. so how does that work when it comes to what we eat? Uh, the, uh, the nose is connected through some fibers, we call them hairs, but they're nerve fibers. It's connected through nerve fibers that go up to see where the arrow is pointing. Uh, that area of the brain is uh, the limbic system, and that's the emotional center of the brain, and that's where your body uh, responds to uh, smells in terms of love and sexual desire, and anger and fear and pleasure and hunger. And it, it is your emotional center. And there is a direct anatomical connection between the air you inhale in your nose, the little nasal hairs that are the nerves of the olfactory lobe, and those nerves of the olfactory lobe go right into that limbic system. And that's why smell is so important and has such great influence on your emotions, including your sexual appeal and your love. The most offensive smell that we come in contact is sulfur. And I think for the best way to you to relate to that is to think about rotten eggs. Very repulsive smell. Or if you uh, remember the Yellowstone uh, National Park sulfur pits, very stinky. So sulfur is uh, what you're trying to eliminate or reduce in your body to get natural, uh, pleasant body odor. If you go to the dentist and you say you have halitosis, you have bad breath, the dentist may take an instrument called a hell meter and have you breathe out of a straw into the hell meter and it measures the amount of sulfur that's in your breath. And then they try and give you mouthwashes that have the property of, of breaking up or covering up sulfur. Sulfur is an element. It cannot be created or destroyed. It has to come from someplace. 
where it comes from in terms of ourselves and our body odor is it comes from the animal foods that we eat. Animal foods are loaded with proteins, and uh, the proteins that they have, have uh, a lot of are, are uh, sulfur-containing amino acids, methionine and cysteine. And uh, that's how the body gets the sulfur, is by containing foods high in sulfur. Well, we measured the content, uh, sulfur content, by the health meter of our patients that came to the program. And we checked it the first day, we checked it the seventh day. But what we found is the sulfur compound content dropped on average 50% in that time. Because we took them off the animal foods and put them on the kind of diet that you're eating now. Uh, let's compare the sulfur content of various foods. Beef provides four times more sulfur than does pinto beans. Eggs, four times more than corn. Cheddar cheese, five times more than white potatoes. You, you've heard of cutting, cutting the cheese, right? Uh, chicken, seven times more than rice, uh, tuna, 12 times more than sweet potatoes. Uh, one of the other things about our program that I have to defend and uh, give you my answer to it is uh, people, when people go on this kind of diet, we've talked about fiber and uh, the fact that, this, that you have a lot of fiber, which is really important. Well, some of those fibers, uh, they're digested by bacteria and turn into gas. So if you eat this kind of diet, you'll have more bowel gas particularly if you go heavily on beans, which have a, a, a sugar that's difficult for us to digest, but it's bacteria to digest. And so people who come through this program, they say things like, uh, uh, have you heard a good Mc McBugler today? <laughs> or uh, when we walk, we talk. <laughs> and as the conversation goes on, they admit, and you will notice, at least in, particularly in the adjustment period of a couple of weeks, when you are growing new bacteria, and always if you eat beans. I mean, when you ate beans and hot dogs and beans and bacon or whatever, it was always an issue of more gas. But as we're having this conversation about having more gas and how funny it is, and people do really think it's funny, especially when they're in a 10-day program with us, uh, they eventually come down to the fact that uh, our gas smells better. Their, their gas, my previous gas, smelled as if something died, and something did die. And that's why it smells that way. So you, um, when you eat the sulfur, what happens is the sulfur in the animal foods, it goes into your gut, uh, through the gut wall, into the bloodstream, and then it circulates in the bloodstream. And uh, uh, through this circulation, it comes also to the lungs, and the sulfur comes out of the body by being exhaled through the lungs. And uh, what you need to understand, even though you're trying hard to get rid of bad breath, you know, we all want to smell good, if you're brushing your teeth, and you're flossing or whatever else to try and keep things clean, which is important. You just can't get rid of that sulfur stink that occurs with every exhalation of your breath because it's internal. Uh, that uh, circulation of sulfur also goes to the skin and you get uh, BO, body odor. And uh, the last thing is, uh, as I talked about, is the bowel gas, where you, know, you don't want that to be noticeable either. Uh, a test, which I thought was relevant to what we're, our discussion. <coughs> they took uh, 17 male donors, and they were tested on a meat or non-meat diet. And they got 30 women to be involved in the test. On each phase of the diet, what they did is they took pads, wipe pads, and they wiped the men's armpits. <laughs> and then what they would do is have these 30 women smell the armpits of the main men on, when they were on the meat and then when they were on the non-meat diet. And what they said of the male donors stink is uh, on the non-meat diet, they were judged as significantly more attractive, more pleasant, and less intense. Doesn't that say it all? It's been tested and proved. That's, a, that's better than the chocolate and acne experiment. <laughs> all right. Uh, additional issues uh, of attractiveness that I want to talk to you about for a minute is uh, conditions that occur with chronic constipation. And, uh, it's important for you to know about. When people eat the Western diet, there's uh, very little fiber in it. 
maybe eight to 10 grams. You're eating 80 to 140 grams of fiber on this diet. So because there's so little fiber in your diet, uh, you make what I call the rock hard fecal marble, which is very difficult to get out of the body. Uh, people will uh, go into the bathroom typically, I'm sure you can remember those days, and read two chapters of Reader's Digest. And, and your efforts would uh, be with great strain to finally get the bowel movement to come out. You would grunt and groan and your face would turn red. What was happening with that strain is you were taking, pushing blood from the venous system uh, in, in, uh, in a backward motion, uh, which caused the, the flush face and caused also other damage, caused damage to the body. As the blood is uh, pushed to the veins at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the uh, gastrointestinal tract, the hemorrhoidal veins, what happens is the hemorrhoidal veins are stretched out and eventually they're stretched out so often and for so long that they hang out of the, out of the butt. Those are called hemorrhoids. And you know, I, I'm not trying to get into your personal life, but hem hemorrhoids aren't attractive. Uh, the other thing that happens, uh, which would uh, apply to your attractiveness, uh, is that this back pressure that occurs from grunting and groaning and straining to have the typical American bowel mood, this back pressure also gets translated into the veins of the legs. Now for the blood to get from the feet back to the heart is a, uh, is, is a great effort. and Because uh, you have to move this huge column of uh, pressure that's created by five feet of gravity. And the way, the way the body does it, it gets blood back from the feet to the heart, is uh, that you have these veins and as you walk, the uh, muscles contract and push the blood. And they push it in an upward direction. And what happens is, if you can look closely on the far left, is the blood flow is kept from dropping back down into the feet by valves that are intermittently placed in the veins. So in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a stepwise manner, the blood is moved back up to the heart. Well, what happens is when you grunt and groan and strain, you destroy the integrity of these valves. And then when the valves don't function, then you have this long column of blood uh, that's pressing on the veins. And what happens is the veins dilate into blue worms, which we know as varicose veins. Again, has to do with attractiveness. You can't reverse either of these conditions, but you certainly do not want to get them if you know why, what causes it, which is the diet. Well, at nearly 70, I can say Mary and I are attractive, at least to each other. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I, if I had the time and I wasn't embarrassed enough to tell you the stories, I, I can just tell you, being 70 is great and being together is unbelievable. Uh, uh, so it doesn't have to, as you get aged, it doesn't have to be one of unattractiveness and unfeelings and uncloseness. And it can all be there. It's supposed to be. It's natural. But if you eat the Western diet for that many years with that many negative consequences, you're not going to attain, maintain the, the beauty that you were given and the attractiveness that you were given to be the you know, the person you could or can be. Well, I uh, have 15 minutes left. Mary and I asked, what I was gonna ask, uh, asked me if I was going to answer some questions. I'd be happy to. Oh, what do you think, Adam? <laughs> See, not, not, not having given that lecture before, I didn't know how long it was going to go on, be, it would last. It, yes? Um, I have one about cholesterol. Um, I became a 100% um, plant eater in 2006, and my blood cholesterol dropped from 200 to way below 150. And um, there have been times now where my blood um, cholesterol went up to 207, and I had it checked here again, it's 180 now. And somebody else who is a 100% plant eater has had a similar problem where the blood cholesterol goes up again, and I was wondering, I mean. Okay. I don't want you to take this personally. Okay. But uh, many people cheat. <laughs> uh, it, I, 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 I've heard this story hundreds of times. Uh, people will come into our 10-day program, 
and they will tell me I have been on your diet strictly for the last two years. Absolutely no oil, no animal foods, exactly what you recommend. And typically we see a 30 point drop in cholesterol in seven days. So whether it's conscious or unconscious, we do a lot of things unconsciously. You know, not really aware of what we're doing or taking the attitude, well, a little bit doesn't matter. Or I went to the restaurant and I said, no oil, uh, you know, no animal foods and so on. Uh, you can't eat at restaurants. Uh, they'll sabotage you every time. So what I would say to you, to you personally is that uh, I would do a test. Uh, I'd go home, you've got a cholesterol level now. Go home and eat exactly as an experiment like we would feed you. In other words, a starch-based diet. And I, do, I have to emphasize the starch so much. Your diet really needs to be 90% starch, just like the other populations that live for you know, hundreds of thousands of years. It really needs to be high in starch. And uh, with some fruits and vegetables, you know, stay away from the nuts and seeds and avocados. Not that they necessarily would have a negative effect, but and, and just see what happens, say, in seven days. Our average drop in cholesterol in 1,615 people, we left nobody out. Nor did we change any cholesterol or any medications. We put no one on them. Some of the people may stop them on their own. But our average drop in cholesterol was uh, 22 points in seven days. And if it started over 240, it was 39 points in seven days. So rather than thinking there's something wrong with you or there's some variable in the diet that you haven't been told or didn't understand, I would first give it a test and see whether it does what it really should do and then think about maybe some of the things that are sneaking in uh, that you thought were maybe of little consequence or no consequence and uh, realize they might be. Well, I have to say, I mean, I was never like 100%, I mean, like really low fat. I would eat nuts and seeds, avocado, and then I, I did quit now eating one piece of chocolate because there are, you know, saturated fats in chocolate. Uh -huh. And you are forgiven. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, it really, if you think the diet's failing, and then again, a lot of people can't get their cholesterol down to 150. I see it all the time. I, I, I see maybe once or twice a program, I see a, a person, particularly a woman, who is eating a good diet well, and her cholesterol will be, say, 230, or I've seen, even seen women as high as 350, in fact, I'm looking at one right now, uh, but, and, and who have uh, been th threatened and hurt by taking statin medications so they couldn't, they didn't want to, and have worried about terribly having a cholesterol of 350, and uh, actually went to the trouble of having a heart scan done where you can virtually look inside the heart arteries and found the heart scan perfectly clear. And what I tried to do, and I've tried to do, and I think I've successfully done, is to convince her that, that she just has a high cholesterol. High cholesterol is a, is a marker, it's associated with more heart disease because the foods that cause heart disease also raise cholesterol. And they also raise TMAO and uh, all kinds of things that cause the arteries to be damaged. It's just, it's just a marker, it's just a number. And some of you have a heredity where your number is going to be high. Uh, for men, I'm not as relaxed about seeing a high cholesterol as I am for women because I've seen it so often, clean arteries and a higher cholesterol than ideal. Uh, I do prescribe cholesterol-lowering medication, which uh, you know, may surprise some of you. Uh, I have a prescri prescri prescription pad. I'm licensed to practice medicine in five states. My prescription pads do last a long time, more than a year. but. Uh, <coughs> I take care of a, a lot of men and some women who have serious artery disease. They've had strokes, TIAs, they've had uh, heart attacks or heart surgery. And these people, just by their history, are at great risk of having a future problem. Now statins, they have significant side effects. And uh, I don't prescribe them lightly. But the data does say they make a tiny bit of difference, a tiny bit of difference but only a difference that you can see in really sick people. If you give statins to people who are relatively healthy, their risk of having a heart attack or stroke is tiny. So if the medication makes a tiny difference, and that's all it does, you can't see it. So you see no benefits for people who are healthy uh, from statins. But for people who are sick, because they have such a high risk of having another problem, 
another stroke, another heart attack, because there's such high risk and the statins make a tiny bit difference, you can see that tiny difference. And it's only a tiny difference. You know, it's like one or two heart attacks over, uh, per 100 people over a couple year period of time. I have the data, it's in my May 2013 newsletter, you can read about who I prescribe statins for. So, you know, one other reason I prescribe statins for people, you know, if I don't think they're in, at high risk of having a heart attack or a stroke, I'll try and encourage them not to take them. But people worry about numbers, and it psychologically disturbs them. And so I can be talked into occasionally, after I've explained all the positives and negatives, I can occasionally be talked into prescribing statins just to help their emotional problem. In other words, their worry over the number. So and I think that's fair, and I think that's good medicine. I, I, uh, but, it's, but it's hard for me to do. Yes? On the topic of attractiveness, one of the comments that I get from people being a long-term vegan, and likewise my friends who are vegans for a long term, uh, they receive comments like, I didn't know you were so old. Uh, so I wondered whether or not you had any research which indicates that the perceived age of vegans is considerably lower than the rest of the population. You mean they look younger? Yes. Oh, yes. I, that's been my experience, what I showed. I've but has seen. it been documented well, or I, is it just anecdotal? And I think it depends on what you want in terms of docu uh, documentation. Uh, Dan Butner was here for the last advanced study weekend and the one before, and he's the uh, author of The Blue Zones. And, uh, you know, this is a National Geographic writer. Did you hear him? No, I did not. Okay. He gave uh, two great presentations. I know a lot of you heard him. And uh, he studied the blue zones, which are populations of people who uh, are longest lived, have the most centurions. And he looked at these people from Sardinia, Italy, and from Loma Linda University, uh, several other populations of people, and tried to figure out, and he did this in 2006, National Geographic. And he's published a book just recently on the blue zones. And you'll see Dan Butner back here again. He's, he's one of our friends. He's part of the group. And uh, they looked at things, different things that made a difference in terms of uh, longevity of populations of people, and they found that community, family, uh, strong family associations were important. Uh, being active uh, was important. But the most important thing that I heard from him say is it was the diet. And he talked about these different diets of these long-lived people, the blue zones. He talked uh, about how that they were uh, vegetarian diets. And, uh, you know, not, not specifically, but they were, you know, sweet potatoes and rice and beans and those kinds of foods. And it was kind of an inter interesting time between he and I the first time he came here as a speaker, which would be a year ago he was here. And also he was here in, uh, in September. He was here last February. But it was the first time we got to meet and uh, talk to each other. And we had breakfast together. And I, you know, of course, it's easy to compliment on his uh, information and his publications. And I said, you know, what do you think the importance of diet is in terms of all the factors? He said, well, I think that diet is the most important. And uh, I said, well, what do you think it is about the diet that's most important? He said, well, what do you mean? Well, what is it about the diet? Well, he said, it's vegetarian. I said, uh, have you thought about the fact that all of these populations of people or star cheaters. He paused, his face kind of dropped. He said, you know, I never thought of that. But since then, he's been giving talks and written in the New York Times and so on, and is now commonly using the word starch. So, you know, that, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists are a community that's been studied in terms of longevity, and I have to say, the number of years you live have so, uh, correlate positively with, by the way you look to other people. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. One compound that affects attractiveness both positively and negatively is alcohol. Alcohol, true. And actually through the conference nobody's talked too much about alcohol, so right. I mean, could you be a little bit more specific about you where you see it fit in your program? And your, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not health food. It's, uh, however, no cholesterol, no fat. Uh, for my, it, uh, almost my entire professional career, I have been offended 
by uh, professionals who say it's healthy to drink wine or other kinds of alcohol. And uh, not that it may not be. I mean, you may reduce your risk of a heart attack by having a glass of wine a day. But uh, when you're talking to an audience uh, of people who have some experience with alcohol, nine of the 10 people I'm talking to can relate, well, I can drink it because it tastes good, it's relaxing, you know, it's a sociable thing. But one out of 10 of you, if you hear me or any other professional connect alcohol and health, you may have destroyed their lives because they're alcoholics and they leave the room and they get in a car accident and kill somebody or go home and beat their spouse. So I think alcohol and health should never be combined in the same discussion in a positive way. And, and, and as long as you gave me the opportunity, alcoholism is, is like smoking tobacco uh, and using cocaine or heroin. Uh, these are problems that people are so uh, attached to that you cannot moderate your behavior to quit them. You must do what Nancy Reagan said to the youth. You must say no. That's the only way I've seen people quit serious substances like this. And likewise with the food, as you heard other lectures I've given, is I never talk about moderation or you cutting down or doing a little bit better. If you really want a different way of life, you really want to lose the weight, get rid of the stomach pains, the arthritis, and so on, you have to divide foods into two categories. Uh, foods that are good for you and foods that aren't. I give a lecture, it's, it's in my color picture book, where I classify the foods that aren't good for you as food poisons. And there are two groups. One are animal foods, and the other group is vegetable oil. So those are the poisons. Those are the things you've got to stop, like tobacco or alcohol. Well, with stopping tobacco and alcohol, what do you do? You drink water and you breathe air. But when I say you can't eat uh, animal foods or oils, a lot of people, and I know there's some in this room, they say, well, there's nothing left to eat until you learn a starch-based diet. Then the whole world opens for you. And there are a lot of us, when it comes to food, it's just like alcohol, or tobacco, or other addictions. You have to just say no. The two groups of poisons, in the term of food, are animal foods and vegetable oils. And the clean stuff, the clean food, like the clean air and the clean liquid, the clean stuff are starches, as I say, 90% of your diet you shoot for, starches, vegetables, and fruits. Thanks for giving me that lead, I, to teach me, teaching how serious you have to be in terms of food. Uh, yes? Hi, um, just two questions about the Kepner diet. Um, the Kepner what, diet, yes. Kepner diet, yeah. What, what fruits did he include or exclude? I, did not, I do not know, know which fruits. Uh, my guess is pretty much all of them. Okay. And uh, I, I never got to meet Walter Kepner. I, I even had a, a TV show at that time where we went all over the country and interviewed people. Like I interviewed Dennis Burkett. He's uh, in my uh, January 2013 newsletter. The only ed interview that exists of, Denver, uh, of Dennis Burkett, uh, who's called the Fiber Man, extremely important person. And in my February 2013 newsletter is an interview with Nathan Pritikin. The only video interview that exists of Nathan Pritikin I had a chance to do. Uh, I wanted to interview Walter Kempner. And I was going to take my TV crew to uh, Durham, North Carolina, to interview him. But Walter Kemper was an interesting person in the sense that he was so private, he wouldn't even allow his picture to be taken. And uh, so I didn't get to do that, but he did read my book. And I know that, uh, McDougall's Medicine, because a patient that became one of my patients, she said she was at the, the Rice House, uh, the programs in uh, Durham, North Carolina, the, where they teach the Rice Diet. And she said, Walter Kemper, he invited me in this room. He said, uh, you see this book here? He said, look, look at this page, look at this man said about me. <laughs> he was so, so proud of the, of the two paragraphs I put in my book, McDowell's Medicine, about this man who in, in my life was uh, crucial. But uh, I'm happy that he at least knew who I was and what I thought about him. But I, I, I miss a personal contact. In, in terms of the diets, I think in the Kempner extreme, it's clearly restorative but not sustaining indefinitely. And the meat diet is clearly degenerative and not sustaining indefinitely. Your diet is both restorative and sustaining indefinitely. Th that's what I Yours say. Yours is the, the Goldilocks is, diet. Yes. 
but what the question was is uh, comparison of the diet that I teach versus Kempner. Uh, I consider what I've taught you the diet of the living. There's nothing to be compromised or ashamed about in terms of enjoying and finding this kind of food. Uh, I call the uh, Kempner diet the diet for the nearly dead. And that's who I use it for. And as I say, about three times a year, the patients that I see, I have to sit down and teach them the Kempner diet. And I say, if you want to live longer off, off that dialysis machine, or you don't want to die of high for heart failure because you've lost so much heart muscle, this is what you have to do. White rice, fruit, fruit juice, and table sugar. But, you know, there are things that are worse. Dr. McDougall, have you ever experienced a client who had such bad gas they could set off fire alarms? <laughs> have I experienced such? Uh, a client that could have such bad gas, flatulence, uh, that could set oh. off fire alarms. You know, uh, not that I can remember. Maybe uh, you can ask Mary later. No, I, 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 I really struggled with those issues when I okay, was uh, the, the, There's an article, it's in my uh, August 2002 newsletter. It's, it's called Bad Farts Meat Stinks. And it talks about gas and how you can deal with gas. And there are various ways, like avoiding beans, uh, <coughs> uh, cooking the beans more thoroughly, all kinds of suggestions. Suggestions on what you can do uh, to help with the gas, and that goes for legumes as well. Well, for who? Ladies? Legumes? Oh, legumes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wonder what was coming next. He's going to tell me about a problem he has. Uh, yeah, the legumes. You don't have to eat, ever eat legumes, or you can thoroughly cook them, or what? What is a guaranteed way to do it is to sprout them first. And that takes away the two sugars that we can't digest. But uh, you know, that's probably the easiest thing is to uh, do something with the legumes. That's the main problem. OK, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to have a, 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 a presentation from uh, the best psychologist in the world, who is one of the most important members of our staff in just a couple of minutes. So take a break and we'll be back with you.